Again, uh, thank you to everyone for joining us for the March Hyperledger subgroup meeting. Um, just a before we start, I, I want to express our appreciation to the Hyperledger Foundation, to Vipin, the chair for the Capital Markets SIG uh, that we fall under, and Karen, our, our Hyperledger contact. They make this meeting and this community possible, and, and I, I just want to express our appreciation to them. Okay, uh, as always, please note that this meeting is being recorded. I think you guys saw the notification and it does fall under the umbrella of the Hyperledger Foundation. So we ask that everyone abide by the antitrust policy and the code of conduct. The antitrust policy states that we avoid discussions of company specific products and pricing and projects. We don't make negative comments about other companies or products. And the code of conduct states that we treat each other with respect, never discriminate, and communicate constructively. We fully support Hyperledger's policy of openness, equity, and inclusion. And also for those new participants, because we do have quite a few new participants today, we welcome you. Um, we ask that uh, you just say hello in the chat. And, and also, I, if you do introduce yourself, please let us know if there are any specific areas uh, of interest. We try to keep this as interactive as possible. Here's our agenda for today. Uh, we've just gone through the meeting and housekeeping. We'll have some brief Hyperledger community information. And then we have, I think, an excellent presentation from Mark D'Angelo. I'll talk a little bit about him. If we have time, we'll go through the state of blockchain in the global mortgage industry, future agenda topics, and Q&A. Okay. We always like to start off with this blockchain journey slide just to show that we're all on the same path. We may be on different points of the path, but we're all following this blockchain journey. And we wanna demonstrate the feasibility of blockchain technology as it relates to mortgage industry and define potential implementation paths for our industry. The one item that I did wanna cover on Hyperledger is that there is a Hyperledger challenge. This is intended to harness the power of the Hyperledger community to ideate, develop, and uh, launch innovative solutions. Um, they want to show that any innovation that advances the current state of the art, enterprise grade distributed technology, and then leverage those in different types of hyper Hyperledger, pro excuse me, projects. Can't seem to speak this, this morning. Just before this call, I perused the list of admissions to date for the call, and they are awesome. Uh, we'll send out the, the link to uh, take a look at those different submissions. And, and as I said, I took a look at it. I really want to know what Kidzania 2.0 is. Just the name alone is interesting. All these other slides, uh, I'm not gonna go through. Uh, I'm just gonna burn right through them, but we like to keep these in the deck and let people know about it so that if you're new, these slides will show you how to join the community, how to join and create an LFID, take a look at the wiki, take a look at the training that's available. And I, I think I just blew, blew through that one. And a lot of this training is free. So we welcome you guys to take a look at this information and to just be part of the community. Okay, I, now I'd like to introduce you to really the meat uh, of today's presentation. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to, to Mark P. D'Angelo. I first became aware of Mark after reading his article Digital Transformations Meet the Metaverse in the MBA News Link. It was an excellent article on the almost frenetic pace of change that's taking place within the financial in services industry due to new technologies. Mark framed the challenge facing companies when he stated that a, a stated a really sobering statistic. 70 to 85% of all digital transformation initiatives historically fail with to be sustainable after 12 months. To, to me, as someone that's been in this industry for over 20 years and, and has done digital transformations in that that's really sobering. So um, with that, uh, a little bit on Mark's background, besides being an 18 year monthly contributor to the MBA and MBA Newslink, 
Mark's also a chief innovation officer, a prior CIO and CTO for Aquin, a principal for, uh, a principal for A.T. Kearney, Ernst and Young, uh, CSE and Stanford Research. Finally, he's a published author of five books, such as The Ramifications of Innovation Singularity, Beyond the Technology Traps, and most recently, M&A Digital Demands. Uh, with that, I would like to turn it over to Mark. Take it away. Thank you, Marvin. Hopefully everybody can hear me. Um, let me flip up to my screen here, if I may. Can everybody see that? Yes? Yeah, we're good, Mark. Okay, good, okay. good. I just, just to make sure, cause you know, I live out in the middle of nowhere as some of you folks know that uh, we still have the cows on the property. So I never know what my internet looks like. Um, thank you all for having me. Uh, I feel actually a little bit um, humble being here. It's like, what do you say to a group of experts? I, I caught the end of the call Marvin had right before this. And, and I'm always amazed, even though I'm a computer scientist by education, uh, the new things that are coming out, the dialogues, the, the acronyms, the, the, the properties and principles we adopt are changing so fast. And, uh, and that's really what we wanted to talk about today. And that's why I focused this presentation, uh, talking about digital transformation, but also talking about blockchain and the technologies that surround it. What do we do with it? And, and that led to the title of this uh, presentation called I'm stuffing the keyhole. And one of the things I should say before I get into this is uh, my, uh, since I do teach uh, graduate studies and in innovation entrepreneurship, if you don't stop me, I can blow through these slides in, in pretty quick time. Uh, so I encourage you to ask questions. I think Marvin, you're gonna watch the, the chat room and, and if you were next to me, I'm sure you'd throw something at me, but uh, I, will, I will continue to look for it. But uh, by all means, submit something to Marvin and we can do this as we go. Don't wait till the end because I think that oftentimes if we don't have time for the Q&A, we'll lose some of the important ideas in the dialogue. Marvin? Yep, definitely. All right, all right good. So again, uh, present, title of this presentation is on stuffing the keyhole. And, and if you, you should have access to the Acrobat file for this, if you, uh, I don't know if they have this in advance, Marvin or not, but uh, it is provided to, uh, to you folks. You can take a look at it uh, and make notes, uh, ask questions. But uh, if you look at the slides behind this title slide, you will see that I don't read slides to you. There's too much information. Uh, this presentation could go three to four hours by itself. Uh, I'm going to try to hit the highlights. You will see those in red. Uh, but again, we want to talk about how does this thing called digital transformation, which is oftentimes failing many enterprises, especially after 12 months, how does this you know, align with things we're talking about today with the metaverse and, and whatever that means? And we're not talking Facebook and, and the rebrand meta. We're talking about something that is how do we deal with tomorrow's technology? And again, then the, the two questions I always have when you start to talk, talking about standards and technologies is we often focus, especially as computer scientists, we focus on things of adoption. We want everybody to adopt what we're doing because this is the right thing and we're confident, we're passionate. But the real question for many businesses and executives are how do we adapt these types of things? And I, I found a little uh, of a cartoon and you'll see these throughout. I, I kind of like cartoons to poke fun at myself and, and those of us in the industry is uh, when we think we have too many standards, what do we do? We say we need to collapse those standards and then we wind up with one more standard or we wind up with one more solution. And you will often hear me talk about things of rationale. It's like, why is this important? But we often forget the implications. And that's one of the things we really wanna talk about in the three areas off to the left side is where are we at today? Putting everything we're talking about for financial services and Marvin asked me to put some mortgage slides in here so you will see some industry specific stuff in this as well. But where are we at? Why does this even make sense? What's the context of what we're trying to do versus let's focus on the technology of what we're doing and the immutability of let's say a blockchain or the security of it. And then we'll talk about laying the foundation for the core competencies. What are those for tomorrow? What does it look like? And then we'll talk about transforming the organization with digital demands. In essence, how do we actually compartmentalize? How do we create layers? How do we transform? And more importantly, for those of you that are starting companies or even uh, 
uh, you know, looking at uh, the supply chains today and talking about uh, what you invest in, what's the ESG, the environmental, the social, and the governance demands that go with what we're doing. So that's our discussion for today. And I always kind of look at this one particular diagram. And, and yes, that was probably me with hair in the middle there. Uh, some of the people that have known me 30 some years. Uh, that's probably how I dress today. And that's how I approach innovation is that I love innovation. I think it's, uh, we look for new things. But when I created the slide, I said, why do we have so much confusion oftentimes within our industry? What's happening today that wasn't happening just five years ago? And I created this slide of all things in about five minutes. I said, what are the things that are happening around us? And, and I just started making a list. And, and this is not inclusive, but these are things that have just popped up in the last couple of, of years. From you know, machine learning, which everybody talks about, to my favorite, which is m and 2.0. Uh, and even though as the, uh, the, co the cover slide that uh, Marvin put up for, uh, for what I do, is I still am actually, even though I, I teach graduate studies, um, I am an author of multiple books and you know, many, many articles. Um, you know, I'm, I'm actually a consultant by trade. So what I am telling you today and what we're gonna talk about is I live and breathe. It's, uh, I believe what we do is a contact sport. We can't sit from the sidelines like an academic and talk about it. We need to be involved. We need to understand what's going on. So this is what uh, we're facing today. And often executives, when they hear things like blockchain or they hear things like data analytics, uh, Python or Rust or you know, uh, cognitive computing or, or blockchain as a service, you know, where do we put all these things into, uh, into our, our mix? What do we deal with our infrastructure and our architectures? And that's when I started to say, okay, let's understand, especially from a financial services standpoint, where we came from. And you can see the one diagram on the left. This is a, this is a DOMO diagram. It's, it's a very interesting diagram of what happens every minute of every day for some of the major platforms. And those numbers are staggering. And again, you may not be able to read them here, but you know, Amazon's booking $278,000 every minute of every day in, in, in top line revenue. You've got, um, let me grab this real quick. You've got Instagram posting 65,000 photos every minute. You've got TikTok uh, having 167 million uh, viewers every minute of every day. You begin to look at those numbers and they're staggering. And we put that into perspective of financial services and what our customers are expecting from us. We can look at the old days from uh, zero ACE, you know, uh, the, the time of uh, uh, when we started recording current time, you know, everything was paper-based probably until the 1980s. I remember uh, my computer science days starting on punch cards and people would probably look at me and my God, you're old. And yes, the dinosaurs were actually doing our computing back then. But if you look at the scale of what we had, we didn't have scale back in the day. We, you know, the idea of disaster recovery planning or DRP was make more copies throw them in a warehouse. We began in the 80s with the, the, the uh, advent of Big Iron. We began to see those transactional systems. Those of us that were in financial services back in the 80s, we may have run across something called IBM's FSDM. And what does FSDM stand? Financial services data model. It was a multi-million dollar acquisition of intellectual property that consumed roughly 18 volumes, 10,000 plus pages, and was every entity, every data element, everything you could ever want to know how a financial services company operated. The problem was, it was too big. We didn't know how to apply it. But that was the rise of transactional systems. We went from flat files to databases. In the 1990s, we started this idea of digitization. Let's get away from paper. And you can talk about the data of a variety, velocity, volumes, and so forth. That kind of leads us into today's world of 2010, which is where we started, give or take a few years. You know, we started to look at digital transformation. How do we take that e-paper from the 1980s? You know, all we really are doing is augmenting paper, doing digital scans. How do we actually leverage that information and look for efficiencies, qualities, improve our processes? And then we get the whole thing called this metaverse, you know, which everybody's talking about. What does that mean? Well, that really means the blending of physical and virtual realities, things like AR, uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, uh, bringing our capabilities to bear in a way that we hadn't thought about before. These are the types of scenarios. This is the story where digital transformation is playing today. And as we get ready to embrace or you know, cringe, if we will, for what this metaverse may happen and what that means, 
this is what's going on. And so we understand the context of what we're trying to do as financial services and the idea of blockchain going into this. And then we can put a little more context in this. You know, we, we look at a phase shift and when we start talking about all the discrete things from tokenization on blockchains, the digital wallets and so forth, what's happened in the last decade? And you begin to see that from microprocessor speed down to the number of fintech vendors back in roughly 2010, 2011, uh, from 200 to 13,500, and that's probably a conservative number. Uh, and you put that number against the number of banks, which today the number of banks FDIC chartered are about 4,750. Uh, and that is down from 12,500 just about 30 years ago. So you begin to look at these numbers and you say, this is uh, a different context of how we apply blockchain. What does that mean? And from a, from a blockchain perspective, the last one highlighted in red was actually, what does blockchain mean? What are we going to do with this? And, and I tend to view uh, all the, the technology and all the components of blockchain, especially for financial services and in particular mortgage, is that blockchain represents the tip of the spear. And you can look at those Gartner statistics at the very bottom of that page, and you can see that really at the start of 2011, it was really insignificant the amount of money that was attributable to blockchain, blockchain solutions. If you understand the Gartner projections uh, coming for 2025, and they are on the high side compared to other folks, I will warn you, uh, they would say there's $176 billion of total revenue to be generated, but that number is going to jump up to $3.1 trillion in 2023. That is very significant, especially when you start looking at the fact that every year in financial services, and, and we can talk about all the technology, we lose roughly 220 to 260 in different institutions. 40% of the financial services revenue is outside the walls of the bank. And we begin to look at where all this is going, even though during COVID, the blockchain number of users, digital wallets have gone up to 81 million, we can look at the oversight and the compliance. And, I didn't have time to put, uh, I didn't have enough uh, space, if you will, in this presentation uh, to fit into the window that, you know, the amount of regulations that are coming forth are huge. Today on a local, federal, and, and, uh, and state basis, there are over 15,000 individual regulations, often by locality, that are impacting banks. That's a huge number. That leads to that $350 billion uh, number up there on regulatory compliance that is going to be spent and the fact that record numbers of fines are being introduced, uh, which is the number right to it. So when we take these things into context, we can see that blockchain has got to play into a very broad, very discrete number of, of institutions. And we should also note that even on the prior slide where we look at 211 to 222, the asset base at that time of 211 was about $15 trillion. The asset base of FDIC banks in 2022 is over $20 trillion. Uh, so the numbers are getting huger and huger with a smaller number of, of organizations. Mark, uh, yes. we have a question in chat. So Maria is asking, are you aware of any concrete you, real use case scenarios that aren't marketing for the metaverse yet? At this point, no. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people talking about different things. And again, uh, I am not an expert of everything that I've seen out there, um, but I know of nothing that's concrete. I know a lot of people that are making waves. I know from Facebook to uh, Microsoft to uh, even Intel, uh, there are a lot of these things that they're talking about doing this. I, I saw something that Intel was working on blockchain on a chip. Uh, there are a lot of these types of avenues that people are looking at but have they come to the practical implementation? I know of nothing that's in full production outside of a pilot. Again, take that with a grain of salt. Everything's coming out every day. Uh, back to the uh, slide four with the, uh, uh, the amount of things that are being introduced. Does that answer? Yes, Mark, I think it does. Thank you. Okay. Uh, again, uh, I'll give some time just so uh, we can get some dialogue going here if, if uh, anybody has questions. When we look at the mortgage space, for instance, we can look at the numbers here. And again, I use a range because there are many different numbers depending on where they are sourced. Uh, I tried to, on all of my slides, give the, the foundational sources. But if you look at the typical uh, cost for a mortgage, and again, uh, we can look at the big bold numbers right there in the middle right side. 
Uh, the average production cost for a loan to originate is somewhere around $8,000. That's what they believe it's going to be. I believe last year, the official numbers I saw were about 78, 7,900. Uh, you compare that against 2007 when the cost was 4,000. Does that mean we have less technology now in 2007 than we do in 15 years later in 2022? Uh, the answer is no, we have more technology and we'll see what that means later on here. But you can see these numbers, they are not going down, they're going up. Um, some people may argue, well, gee, it's the point spread, it's the amount of uh, the cost of the homes, the cost of whatever. Uh, some of it, sure. Uh, other parts of that, likely not, because we have to be actually be able to recover the cost for our technology. And one more thing to consider in the context of what we're talking with blockchain here. It used to be, if you look at uh, back to uh, slide, uh, slide four with the, uh, the progression from paper into the metaverse, the reality was that innovations, and, and you know, I, I, when I talk to grad students who are launching their companies as part of the incubator we work with, um, you know, the idea of innovation, the idea that you can actually have a business model that lasts multiple years is probably a false flag. The innovation today is actually based on months and weeks more than it is years. And these are the realities that financial institutions, mortgage professionals, especially independent mortgage professionals, are going to have to deal with, is that the things that we thought would keep people out, regulation, technology, the ability to get the data, uh, are no longer barriers to entry. And we are beginning to see more and more of this actually eat into the market share here in a second. Uh, oftentimes we look and we say, okay, uh, how many unique products are within the banking sphere? Um, I've argued and continue to argue that probably 50 to 75% of all, more, or all banking products are commoditized around uh, every single provider of the 47, 50 that are left. How many of them are really unique? You could argue some of them have different uh, mobile apps. They have different capabilities. They allow you to transfer money differently. They don't have fee-based, uh, let's say, overdrafts like uh, some of the big providers are getting away from. But that is not necessarily a difference in the product itself. That is a difference in how the product is applied to the market. So we begin to look at the market and say, what is a loan? Uh, a loan is pretty much uh, consistent across the board. And that where was blockchain and hyperledger ideas come into bear? Uh, from my perspective, they are enablers, they are catalysts that allow the transition to happen. And we can see what I'm talking about is kind of the, one of the last context slides here is that these are FDIC slides. These aren't something that Mark interpreted and, and created so he could make his point. You begin to look at the growth of uh, the mortgage share or where the non-banks have overtopped the, uh, in the very bottom center there. Uh, you know, non-banks are actually originating more than banks in the mortgage space. If you look at the amount of outstanding mortgage value on the top left, you will see that, you know, it continues to decline for traditional banking product, traditional FDIC governed. And then you look at the cost of servicing on the top right, uh, it's a five times increase. And those, no, those numbers keep on rising, even as we add more and more innovation, even as we add more technology. And you're beginning to see this, uh, and you're beginning to see the non-traditional players. Uh, Marvin mentioned my article from, uh, from last month where we, I put that in the MBA. Um, you know, we're beginning to see people like Walmart. You know, we talked about Walmart as a bank probably back in the early 2010s, and, and we said, oh, they're going to be the next bank. Well, Walmart didn't necessarily become a bank, but they have launched their own thick, uh, thick, uh, fintech firm here in the last 60 days, and they've also applied for seven different patents they're beginning to start flexing their muscle. They're beginning to look at the markets and say, where else, where else should we be uh, looking? They launched an NFT to basically uh, uh, keep their customers loyal. There's all sorts of these things that are going on that are impacting our, our models and our markets. And this is where we start to look at how does blockchain, how does the hyperledger, how does everything we're talking about on very discrete standards uh, fit into this? And that's really the context that we're talking about for these types of presentations. Uh, um, I'll pause uh, there. Yeah, I'll pause there for questions, thoughts. Uh, on the previous slide, where you were talking about uh, the cost related to originating and processing a mortgage, yeah, uh, eight thousand dollars now is close to four thousand in two thousand and seven. Um, as I'm sure a ton of people on this call have, I've refied within the the past couple of years. And I, as a consumer uh, of mortgage and also as someone within the industry, I see those numbers, I see my own experiences 
And I see all these companies spending money on digital transformation, but the cost of origination, originating a mortgage keeps increasing. When is there gonna be some realizable or tangible benefit? When are we gonna see those numbers start to decrease in terms of loan production costs? Or is, is that something that's just not gonna happen? Oh, I, I believe it's gonna happen. Do I have a crystal ball to tell you exactly when? No, uh, but I do believe that's gonna happen. You actually, that's one of the things we're gonna talk about this uh, laying the foundation for core competency. Uh, the reality is, is that oftentimes in the mortgage space, especially, and, and, and I, I tend to be a little bit of an outlier on this, and, and uh, my editor, Mike Sorahan's at the very bottom of my screen, and I see Mike there, and he's probably cringing on the other end. And, and one of the things, you know, I, I keep on saying is that if we look at mortgage as part of an overall financial services supply chain, and again, supply chain, everybody thinks manufacturing, they think uh, something that isn't us in terms of financial services. If we begin to look at that as part of a greater mindset of non-traditional competitors coming in, that's exactly how they're going to view it. They're going to look at the value add processes, and we're going to see a few of these in about two or three slides. They're going to look at these and say, what do we need? How can we automate? Where is the data? What's that data transformation is allowing us to do with processes? And oh, by the way, if I have a behavioral change in my customer, which we see that with a lot of uh, people like you, Marvin, with regards to you're, you're digitally competent, you understand mobile technology, you understand your information, where it goes, that, that is going to be more and more common as the, you know, the baby boomers of the world, we begin to get out of those markets and the Gen X, the Zs, the, um, the millennials and so forth begin to actually start to embrace these types of technologies. They're going to say, why am I paying for this? And they're going to go to providers. They're going to look at the supply chain and say, I want people that make this simpler. I want it to be, I want people that can reduce this from 55 days or 45 days or 70 days into something that is 15 days, 10 days. And as the world begins to go more and more digital, as the digital transformation embraces more of the uh, industries out there, including property, casualty, government, what have you, that reality is going to be there. And for the traditional mortgage provider, the independent mortgage provider that says, all I do is, is push, push it over the fence or I push it to a GSE and I'm done, and, but it takes a certain amount of time, that is going to transform and that's going to change. And I think when the, the, long, the, the, the net of this long answer to you is that as, as the industry begins to wake up from that and the customers basically drive that, you're going to see that idea of supply chains across finance become more common and shorten this to a significant stage. Because again, what's the difference in one mortgage product versus another? And again, there are unique differences, but in the grand scheme of things on a macro level, they're, they're, you're lending money and you're getting payments. And, and again, that's, a very, that's very much an oversimplification uh, because we know the nuances, but that is what's gonna transform some of this is that it's got to take time and, and the cultures of the organizations um, have to change as well. So Mark, Maria's got another great question. Um, what about regulations? How much can really be changed considering the current regulations? For example, Honda data being requested up front or how credit information is requested? I think you're going to see some of that. If you even look at the executive order uh, that went out yesterday from the White House, I think you're going to see, remember I had on slide two, what are the rationale, what are the implications of adopting certain things? If you look at that executive order for responsible digital assets, uh, I think some of those regulations are going to get wrapped up in that. It may take you know, 18, 24, 36 months to change that type of regulation uh, in terms of who gets information, how they do it, what they see. But I think that is going to create a phase shift uh, because now people are going to say, oh, I have a digital dollar. Uh, we have a digital yawn. We have uh, the digital sand dollar, which was introduced. And, and we can look at all these things in terms of digital basis and say, well, if they can do that with currencies, sovereign currencies, uh, what does that do to the assets? And I think that's, that's where that tip of the spear is going to lead us, is that that's going to break the veil, veil of barriers uh, or air barriers to entry in terms of when this happens. But I, I don't think it's gonna to be tomorrow. I'm not sure it's even gonna be this year, but uh, that is a very valid question. 
But I think we need to prepare for that. And that's as we talk about blockchain, we talk about uh, the, the benefits of Hyperledger and so forth and all the products associated with it. I think that's something that's got to change and will change as a result of some of these, these uh, government changes that are going on. Yeah, it's really interesting, Mark, because I know in some of our previous presentations, we've talked about the GSEs and, um, you know, Jenny May or Ginny Mays actively investigating, Fannie Mays actively investigating blockchain. Freddie Mac's not quite there yet, um, but we see them starting to get on board. But yeah, I think there's still a road ahead of them. Well, um, also, you know, Mark mentioned the White House briefing that came out yesterday. Alma just posted a link to that. So if you guys are interested in learning more, about the uh, White House briefing, um, click on the link in the chat. Because my question goes to the fact that um, the use of blockchain, it's not just one more technology because it's basically, you, ha it, you have to change the process and the process is set by the regulations. Otherwise it's the, the use it gives is not as, put, is not as, um, or it's not as good and, and actually as it could be, right? And it's kind of like you've got these stoppers, these doors that you could remove to get an open space room right now. And nope, they're demanding that you put up walls. Um, and, and so so it's kind of like the, 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 the same regulations don't help currently to implement things that might lower that origination cost that you mentioned, for example. You are correct. And, and, but one of the things that also allows us to do, it gives us time to think these through because oftentimes I'll go back to all the, the things that are hitting us. We, we want to embrace it. We want to stuff all this stuff into the keyhole and get it done right away. The beauty to some degree, and I, I guess I, I'm a, more of a glass half full on this particular thing. It allows us to implement an engineering mindset that says crawl, walk and run. I can begin to get the processes changed. I can begin to develop the roadmaps. I can begin to understand the iterations that are gonna to have to happen when the regulations change. And this gives me a mindset also to change the organizational cultures and our partners' cultures. I mean, because if we view financial services products and the money that's flowing through as part of an overall supply chain, then we begin to say, I can't change all this at once because it's just too complex. It's too, too much regulation. It's too many people involved. It's too many different standards, um, but it allows us to, to get time to set up. And I think over a period of time, if we uh, adopt that, those of us that you know, came from enterprise architecture backgrounds as IT, uh, those that are leading a strategy for, for business transformation, you can begin to lay those out in workable blocks, uh, building blocks, if you will, uh, that allow us to transform from where we are today to where we want to be. It's not going to be an overnight sensation. And I don't know if, even if it was, if they change the regulations tomorrow, how many people would actually be able to get it spot on correct? Yeah, I guess that in a way they're actually currently, it's like the uh, regular. So it's the big lenders that, uh, the the really big lenders that for them it would be a huge overhaul but maybe for the smaller ones they would adapt really quickly so in in delaying changes you're you're favoring the lenders not necessarily the borrowers right um uh so yeah i guess you is yeah there, there, there you, is you are right you you are right that currently before government could take time to decide how um, to regulate technology. And now technology is demanding of government a, a, a very um, fast, rapid response time that government is not used. And that's worldwide, right? It's not only in, in, in the US. Correct. Um, but, it, but it is true that you've got huge new technologies that you wanna start using, but you wanna have the 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 legislation in place or whatever to and it's not there <laughs> and, and you know as part of the legislation we also don't have the legal uh background to to backstop some of this stuff it hasn't been challenged those of us that can went through the, the remember if you went through uh, those of us that were here a part of 2007 and 2009 meltdowns uh, look at the uh, the challenges that went around something called MERS, if you remember those days, and who owned the title of that and the, the chaos that surrounded that. 
um, and 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 we we didn't we didn't have the precedent, I guess, is what I would say. And I think some of that will come to be as time goes on. But as technologists, I'm I I am always convinced we can create the best technology. We can overcome our technology hurdles. The challenge is all these other things as you're talking about, Maria. Can the government do it? Can can we as lenders or borrowers uh, even adapt to it? Um, you know, again, you got different demographics that may or may not uh, want it. You've got the banked and the underbanked. Can they get through it? What kind of what kind of information do they have? And when we start talking about this, whatever this metaverse expectation is going to allow us, then who controls the information? Because now in that kind of a world, we are going from a centralized type of clearing and repository, which is really the underpinning for our bank system since the 1920s. Uh, now we're going to something that's completely decentralized or quasi-centralized. Where does that go? Um, and these are the kinds of challenges that we can't solve overnight. Hey, Mark. Oh, I, I agree. Hey, Mark, Pedro here. Hey, so Pedro. If, if I can take a, a stab at that for Maria, I think it's in, in the past. Um, you're right. There is this whole legal regulatory pillar, right? And the technology had to adapt into whatever was set in the, that legal regulatory uh, pillar. The technology is advancing so quickly these days that it's way ahead of where legal and regulatory are. And so legal and regulatory are trying to figure that out and catch up and eventually they'll merge. But, but you're right, there's no, I, I don't think there's a, a set plan on, you know, driving this technology or driving the, the, the legal regulatory stuff to to favor one segment of, of the business versus another, right? Small versus large banks. It, it, it will eventually happen, but it'll happen over time, kind of like the, the, the cryptocurrency stuff, right? The, uh, a, a, uh, what, what's the term, uh, Mark, for the, the- CBDCs? CBDC, right? Everybody wants to, to look at that and, and they don't they don't want to be the first one, but they don't certainly don't want to be the last one out there. Um, they're, they have no idea what the, the legal regulatory implications of that are going to be. But I know that in the background, they are experimenting to, to figure out, well, when this op does open up, where do we want to position ourselves and what do we want to do? So it, it, it's sort of a dance, right? Um, it, if you go out too far, too fast, you may or may not be on target, uh, but you certainly don't want to be uh, uh, an absolute laggard because then this market is going to change so quickly that you'll never have enough runway to catch up. And, that, and uh, I want to add a couple points to what Pedro just said, because uh, I, I think he was spot on. When I think about transformation, I, I think about what's already happened within the the grocery and consumer market. And if you take a look at what happened with Amazon and, and the mom and pop grocery stores, it, it was a cataclysmic change. And what we're taking a look at now is transformation that can be evolutionary or, or it could be cataclysmic. And what happened with Amazon is it started out evolutionary and then before you know it, it was cataclysmic. And then Kmart, Sears, all of those large retail companies were gone and you just had this behemoth of Amazon. So I, I think to the point that uh, Pedro is making, that evolutionary change is taking place right now. And I can almost guarantee you, there is someone out there that's building a solution that's going to completely disintermediate our industry. And what we as practitioners need to do is how do we position ourselves when something like that comes to bear and how can we try and anticipate and benefit from it? Because although we're in the evolutionary start or phase right now, it's gonna be cataclysmic. Blockchain is gonna be one of the catalysts that, that, that speeds up that change and government guidelines and the GSEs they're, they're gonna try and slow it down, but they're gonna be overcome. They're, they're already behind the curve on this one and they're trying to catch up. So it, it's just a matter of when that cataclysm takes place. Agreed. Anything else? 
I'm kind of con uh, conscious of the time here. If we uh, we're about 20 minutes above uh, the hour here, or below the hour. Um, let me continue, and then if there's something else, uh, because we've got a few more slides, I'd like to, to at least get through. And again, if you view the, uh, this is a mortgage example, and this is an SEC diagram of all things, uh, it's a couple years old. But if you look at the how a mortgage fl flows through from, from originating it, been to the, the GSEs, into the federal governments, into foreign governments, into insurance markets, into private mortgage insurance, you begin to look at those numbers and those flows, and you can say, there are a lot of connection points. And that's the whole purpose of this diagram. The numbers have changed a little bit, of course, in two years. But how this information flows is not just a one-way flow. Think about if we go back to 2008, 2009, 2010, when we try to figure out how do we, how do we unravel a mortgage-backed security? What's in it? What, what was in that tranche? What was uh, first tier, second tier? And then we start to say, okay, you've got covered bonds across the, the pond. You begin to look at all these instruments and they are composed of either slices, uh, whole mortgages, whatever, but they are all part of a supply chain. And that is the mindset here. And I think one of the things at the very bottom left-hand side, you begin to see it that uh, the last the one paragraph, it says, this requires a shift of sentiment. And I think that's where we're at today is that we have the technology, we have the components, we have the ability to most degree to do this. But if we don't understand how it's applying to the whole process, the supply chain, the flows, that can go one way, but it also comes back the other. And that's what I'm saying. The supply chain is a two-way street. And things like blockchain and hyper um, ledger and so forth allow us to guarantee those chains for the integrity. But it doesn't necessarily mean that's the end all to be all. There are catalysts to help us get something done. And that's how I, as a, a, a banking advisor, a consultant, a writer, people I talk to, that's how I view these things is that it gets me to that process. Now, if you look and I'm going to get a, this is going to be your next couple of slides are going to be kind of ugly if you don't have them in front of you. But, you know, a couple of years ago, I started to say, what's in a mortgage? And, and, and I, I was able to cobble some stuff together from the, the sources down there. And I began and I had 72 boxes. And why do I have 72? Because it fit on the screen. Could I ask, could I put more? Sure. Could I take a few of these away? Sure. But you began to look at these generic boxes and say, what happens when we begin to, you know, to some of your points, when we begin to disintermediate this, we begin to cut some of these out. The technology makes these points really I don't want to say obsolete, but they become automated is maybe a better way to say. They become decentralized. They become controlled by our customer. Uh, they, they become controlled outside of our, our silos. And we begin to say, what happens when this thing with our technologies starts to cross some of these things out? And again, this is just a what if, but when we start to dive into this, when we start to look at what we are recommending for the in industry in terms of technology standards, uh, interaction models of or patterns of, of business models, where do these things begin to go? And that's really the idea of the supply chain. If we understand the information flow and, and we believe in the ideas of big data, whatever that means, but if we understand that there is a lot of information out there growing at nearly, some people would say 90% a year, I think the consensus is 75% of the year. When you look at the amount of information, how does it fit with all these boxes? And that's where somebody to, I think it was Marvin and Pedro talked about, is that people are gonna figure this out and they're gonna say, as a provider, as a vendor, as an innovator, starting a, a startup, as a venture capitalist investing in these things, I like what they're saying because they can shorten this process on the bottom from 45 to 60 days to something else. They can begin to take out non-value added processes because the digital transformation has provided us that capability. Digital transformation, and, and as Marvin start, start, uh, said early on, you know, 75 to 80% of these uh, fail after 12 months. Why is that? Well, I think that's because oftentimes we still have that transactional mindset. We think things are a transaction, especially in financial services versus a solution. And that leads us to this whole digital transformation. And oftentimes what I term the D squared, I squared, you know, we define, develop, implement, and as banks and, and financial firms and mortgage providers, we often don't iterate. We don't realize that that cycle is continuous. Digital transformation today is not a one and done. Why do we think 90% of all organizations, sea levels uh, across the board of the Fortune 500, 90% of them believe that they've got digital transformation down pat. They're good. And you sit there and say, really, what happens after 12 months? 
because they're not thinking that this is a continuous or an iterative type of process. They don't look at things as building blocks. As technologists, oftentimes we, we think in building blocks. We think in containers and compartmentalization. We embrace orchestration and assembling and disassembling stacks. We, 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 we live and breathe this. But when you look at the funding, the budgets, the, what goes into the infrastructure, those things really from a cultural standpoint haven't changed. And it's because to some degree, the, the regulations, the mindsets of how that supply chain works is still in, 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 in its changing process and metamorphizing. And this is where uh, one other thing I wanted to highlight real quick on this, uh, given our time, is that we're going to see this more and more, especially in financial services. Uh, uh, you know, for those of you that know us, uh, Pedro and I have been working on patents for what we call uh, M and A uh, digital or uh, data clean rooms. And we look at this and say, how do we then take those types of ideas and be, begin to project using digital twin solutions? And again, borrowing something from another industry, borrowing something from manufacturing or retail, looking and saying, how can we begin to model these things out and project the future? And when you begin to look at the regulations and so forth, this allows us to apply gaming solutions and say, is my roadmap correct? So again, things are changing. Um, and that kind of leads us into uh, this, this diagram, which we could talk about for half an hour and we don't have that time. Uh, but this is a diagram, the, 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 uh, uh, the painted black uh, brick wall on the back there. Uh, I started thinking about digital transformation and what that means and where it's going to go and, and what leverages this. And, and again, we can talk about this offline, but the idea is how do you leverage these digital capabilities into something that's future? And that, include the meta universe that could include things like even ml and, and and ai for our financial models and we begin to look at all the things that that correspond to that if you want to see this there are probably half a dozen articles i've written in the last two years on this particular model this model is also referenced in the digital transformation meets the metaverse which was published in the mba last uh, last month this also then goes down from if we're gonna embrace this idea of the metaverse uh, and understand regulations, here's the idea of crawl, walk and run at the very top. And to some degree, digital transformation is really the sunsetting of transactional mindset for financial services. And for all the reasons, all the diagrams, all the information that's on the right side there is that we cannot think in transactions anymore. If we believe that blockchain or even solutions within the Hyperledger Foundation are, we're viewing these from a financial transaction type of an approach, uh, it's not just going to be the regulators that probably say, well, we don't think so. I would say your customers are not going to think so. They're going to say, we want an organization that gives me a solution set, provides me that capability. And that's where we start talking about leveraging those digital capabilities into something new. And the very bottom hand there is uh, the agility, the adaptability, and the iteration. Very key in digital transformations, but also one of the, the primary causes why 70, 80% of them actually fail. Uh, everybody thinks it's about adoption, it's a one and done, and the reality is that is not the case. Whoops. Finally, I, I, I would be uh, uh, remiss if I didn't talk about smart contracts. Uh, and again, on the right side there with the great Bay X over it, that's tr tr uh, traditional data set mindsets that we actually came to be. If you look back from the early, um, uh, like I said, those of us that are in financial services, it was IBM Big Iron uh, and the models that went with it and the solutions. That, that mindset right there on, the, on that diagram is still pervasive today. And what's happening with the fintechs, with the reg techs and all the other vendors that are coming is they're saying that is the way we used to think about it. And the regulators, to Pedro's point, Marvin's point, and even James's point, is, is really going to change it. And I think that's, uh, Maria, where, where you begin to look at, say, if I were to look at these smart contracts, if I were looking at things, what does that do to uh, the regulatory aspects? Well, you know, we think regulatory just on government uh, for oversight for the financial services. You've also got the internal audit specifications. And, and I would refer to you, if you really want to look at what blockchain does to an audit process, internal or external, uh, Deloitte and KPMG have very good briefings out there to talk about this. And I'm talking, you know, more than a three-page glossy. Uh, they have things that actually start talking about the changing of culture, the changing of components. What does that do when you begin to introduce these into our industries? And again, what we're talking about here today 
could equally be applicable to healthcare, or it could be applicable to uh, private equity or finance, other financial services areas, as well as even retail and telecommunications, high tech, whatever. Uh, these are not unique to our industry. And that's another point I guess I would say is if we understand the fact that everybody, other people have wrestled with this, uh, we can borrow shamelessly of the lessons learned and begin to apply those to our, our, our own processes and our own mindset. And one statistic uh, that I did find, and I'm, I'm apologies for not putting the attribution on there on the very bottom in the red, uh, there's a mindset, there's a belief out there, and, and I haven't seen the discrete data that backs it up, but they're saying in total, if we were to pull off the regulations, if we were to pull in uh, the customers and begin to transform our processes correctly and disintermediate uh, the commoditized products that are out there, blockchain could effectively reduce 30% of the bank's infrastructure cost. Now, if you look at that and put it to some of the big players like Morgan or, or Citi or, or uh, Wells, uh, those numbers would be in the billions just on a particular organization. So when you begin to look at these types of things, the potential is huge, but the problem is we cannot think that a one size fits all. And I'll take a quick break here and then we'll kind of go through the last Marvin. Um, yeah, uh, on that previous slide, when you're talking about the benefits that utilization of smart contracts can generate, does that also take into consideration some of the benefits that smart contracts in addition to usage of stable coins? Um, because when we're out talking with different companies, it, stable coins tokenization is on the tips of their tongue as well as something that they expect to to help expedite transactions, at least within the mortgage industry and potentially disintermediate uh, different processes. So what type of connection do you see with smart contracts and tokenization or, or use of stable coins? I, I, I don't, right at this point, given the fact that we have no legal precedent for some of these things, given the fact that there is no template for, for many of these, uh, because again, what's left out of a, a, a smart contract, I think right now they're all linked until we can actually get a little more headway. Uh, I don't know how you cannot talk about them all at this point because they haven't been compartmentalized by themselves. They are right now, in my mind, interrelated. And so I don't think you can. Uh, however, uh, will that be the, the case in 2023? I look for some of those things to begin to be broken out and, and put in their own little stacks as we begin to know more and more. Um, you know, one of the things when we start talking about uh, blockchain in our industry, I would tell you to take a look at, and, and most of you probably are familiar if you're on a mortgage side, take a look at Redwood Trust and some of the stuff they had done with the uh, securitization side of the mortgage aspect and blockchain. Uh, they did not, if I, my memory serves me correct, is that th that was not a smart contract Im implementation but it would not surprise me, uh, the next player that comes in will begin to do some of that. Yeah, and for those of you in the chat, we posted a link to the wiki. We've actually got an article on Redwood Trust posted on our wiki site as well. And I think they were actually awarded a Housing Wire Award this last week here uh, for some of the work they've done, uh, kind of generating market awareness. So uh, that, that was back in 2020, I think the, uh, uh, Q4 of 2020 is when they started that. I think the paper was published uh, Q2 last year, I believe. Hey, Mark, this is Angel. I just want to jump in here. Thank you so much. Uh, this is just fascinating. Um, I, I just want to share a couple of thoughts. You know, um, mm -hmm. I started in the mortgage business in 1992, and you know, half our leadership team at the time were complaining about RESPA and TILA, which came into effect in 74, right? And I, I just saw that, um, you know, a big part of dealing with regulations and a big part of dealing with technology and all the things that you talked about, one of the things that I really want to make sure that, that, that we get the message out there is leadership, right? And so that as you, as a mortgage enterprise, as you start to grow, right, or whatever size you are, right, once you get into an organization, you're funding 2,000 loans a month, 5,000 loans a month things start to get compartmentalized, right? That holistic view of the enterprise, the deep understanding of your technology, the fragmentation of your technology and all the APIs and all the different vendors and all the different processes and all the compliance overlays and all the 
you know, uh, paper, paper clips uh, and super glue that's keeping that whole process, right? Leadership is going to help understand all those moving parts and inspire the leaders in those compartmentalized areas, not just to optimize their areas of responsibility, but to think upstream and downstream, right? And to be holistic thinkers about, hey, I'm an origination person. I have to submit these documents. I, I have title and closing partners. I have um, notary signing partners. Those documents need to get back. They need to be in a stacking order. I got to get them to post closing. Secondary's got to do that. They need their data, right? So if we get, if leadership takes that next step and helps everybody in the organization start thinking holistically and have that awareness that, hey, those, there's 72 boxes in that one slide that you showed, right? Right. Once you have that awareness that, oh my God, there's 72 boxes. Well, guess what? I can make a process change or I can implement a policy or I can find a point solution that's not just going to help my little box or my two boxes, but it's going to have downstream impacts and upstream impacts, right? And Correct. so technology is a tool for the business, right? And, and leadership is a big part of the results and the performance, right? And so mm -hmm. the, I know organizations today that it doesn't cost them 8,000 loan, 8,000 to fund a loan, right? Why? Why is that? And, you know, everybody has the same playing field. Everybody delivers to the GSEs in the same product box, the same guidelines. Yeah, some lenders may have some overlays, right? Most of the industry is on a big box utility vendor using the same vendor, the same tools. So why is it that some lenders can outperform, um, produce loans at a lower cost, provide a better customer experience, right? What is that? What, what is that secret sauce? Just from my opinion and my view, my perspective, a big part of it is leadership. And so I just want to make sure that, you know, people listening to this, this is all valuable information, but we got to get inspired from a leadership standpoint, right? One day people, wherever you are in the organization, you're going to be responsible, not just for one box, but for two boxes. And the way you grow your career is by understanding that there's 72 boxes, right? And one day you'll be in charge of those 72 boxes, right? Exactly. Um, so for what it's worth, I just want to share that, Mark. I'm fired up. I'm very, very motivated uh, by what you've been sharing. Man, and I, this is very, very exciting. So thank you. No worries. No worries. I am going to try. I know we're at the top of the hour, at least according to my clock in front of me, but I want to try to get through at least the last couple of few things uh if i may if i have that time marvin yes okay um again oftentimes as technologists we think about the happy path and that's on the right uh, middle side there is a re realize this from a banking standpoint everybody's like oh banking branches are the wave of the future we lose 55 to 70 branches every day and that is showing no sign of, of, of changing we've lost nearly 20,000 in the last 10 years on average we lose 2,000 a year banking branches around this country that is the trend for a decade and we lose a banking branch every 36 hours or a banking brand. And when I look at the future of blockchain, you know, it's, it's all about those things, but it's, it's shifted the discussion from componentization to, as Angel was talking about, the holistic nature, the leadership nature. What does that mean? How do I do that? And, and we can talk about the metaverse, but I would just tell you there's four questions you always got to ask. And, and I challenge uh, uh, people that are in the incubators that I work with and, and so forth is, you know, they always tell me the how they tell me this is how we're going to do it. And I'm like, well, that's great. You know, that's, that's, that's the first step. But back to the other point is like, who's going to do it? What do they want? And why should I do it? And that's really where we start. To, if we're going to frame our ideas on the metaverse and what that means for financial services, that's how we have to look at it. Because at the very bottom of that crazy diagram is that, you know, the castle walls are going to be stormed because they don't have the same limitations. Real quick on this, I look at blockchain as a disintermediation of the markets. I look at it as a catalyst for that market. Uh, Pedro Fong, who's on this, uh, this call, Pedro allowed me to, uh, to publish his, uh, his one diagram, kind of a, a mortgage use scenario, which integrates things. And we, can, we don't have time to go do, do this, given our, our, our point. But the idea here is that we can look at this. And, and there are many patents around these types of ideas, depending on who you look at. But how do we look at that information flow? What do we do? If we look at this holistically, if we look at this from a leadership standpoint, this is what we're talking about. 
it's not about just a cloud solution or reporting or native cloud or everything else that we talk about in our in our technology comments. It's talking about how does this actually transform, the digitally transform what we're doing. Uh, I see Marvin, you came off mute, but let me just finish this one thing if I can. Uh, you know, again, what are the data complexities? The idea here on the right side is if we do this the correct way, if we add the right discipline, rigor, we go through this on a stepwise type of process, maybe we can get that down to 10 to 15 days. And finally, in the end, I would say, you know, uh, we got to keep separation. We got to look at the unknown unknowns. And I love this diagram because I'm always, you know, diagramming stuff. And then you step back and say, what the heck did I write? And it looks like this. That's the problem. When we start talking to leadership, we start talking to executives, we start talking, you know, of stuffing that keyhole with as much as we can, because that's what we know as technologists, computer scientists, innovators that we have to do. The problem is we're the only ones that can understand it. And, and we're not looking at it from the supply chain perspective. And, and again, bottom line, one size will not fit all. We're talking about layers. We're talking about stacks. We're talking about interoperability. We're talking about, uh, you know, atomic swaps. We're talking about all the crazy things that people, you know, issue as, as a matter of fact, you know, it's our nomenclature. Nobody else gets it. We need to bring that back to the business value. We need to bring it back to the supply chain. And oh, by the way, we have to have core competencies around us. And I will turn it over to you, Mark. Any final thoughts, questions? And I know we're a few minutes past. I apologize. Uh, the, thank you, uh, Mark. That was fantastic. Uh, and, and all of this information will be posted on our wiki uh, within the next day once we convert the recording. And we will hand out Mark's contact information. So we do have another uh, minute or so. Are there any pressing questions or comments for Mark before we all sign off? I apologize, kind of running through the last few slides, but again, the information's there. Take a look at uh, when Marvin sends them out or post them for everybody. If you got any questions, comments, uh, uh, you can hit me up or, or I can, you know, put you onto somebody in my network as well. Okay, th thank you, Mark. And thank you everyone for joining this call. I think this has been a fantastic call. And Mark, uh, we'd like to invite you maybe later on in the year, we'll see where things are going in our industry and you can give us an update. Excellent, I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, thanks everyone for joining. <laughs>